thank you firstly to um, the Louis Body Society for organising today and for um, inviting me to speak. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jay Ammon. I'm an associate professor and consultant in old age psychiatry, uh, working down in Southampton on the south coast in the UK. Um, and I think it's fair to say I couldn't have got this job without the support of the Louis Body Society, who funded my PhD project between, I think, around 2014 and uh, this year, really. Um, so a huge thanks to the Louis Body Society uh, for, for funding the work that I'm, I'm going to be presenting to you today. Um, in terms of the structure of my talk, uh, I'll spend a bit of time just talking about what inflammation is um, to give you some background, and then I'll go on to the uh, various parts of the project that the Louis Body Society funded, um, and I'm happy to stop at various points and I'll answer any questions that might come up in the chat. I can't see the chat on my screen at the moment, but when I um, stop uh, sharing my screen at the break points, I'll, I'll be able to see the questions and then respond. Um, so that's the kind of general format of today. Um, so in terms of what dementia is, I don't need to really say, say um, much about this to, to the audience here today, but um, I will just mention that although we know that around 850,000 people in the UK have dementia, and that number is only set to rise in the future, um, at the moment we think that around uh, 4 to 7% of people with dementia have a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies, and I'll abbreviate that to DLB if that's okay. Um, we think that number might be significantly higher, though, depending on um, uh, or, or based on results from um, post-mortem studies, which um, give an indication that it could be anywhere near as high as 10 or 20 percent of people with dementia. So um, there's still lots of under under recognition of DLB um, in the in the clinical community, and that's really unacceptable. So there are um, lots of incorrect diagnoses, delayed diagnoses, and, 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 and that needs to be much better. Um, the other factor to mention um, is that uh, despite our knowledge of the different causes of dementia, we still don't have any drug treatments that can stop it in its tracks or reverse the changes that have happened already in the brain. Um, and if I turn to Alzheimer's disease for a moment, there's been lots of research looking at trying to remove certain proteins from the brain like amyloid and tau. And they have largely, those studies have largely failed. Um, and I think that that really prompts a, a rethink about what it is that causes um, dementia. So is it the proteins that um, build up in the brain or is it something else like the immune system that, that could be a, a factor? Um, Southampton is, is a sort of world leading center in, in terms of um, exploring the role of inflammation in dementia, firstly with Alzheimer's disease and, and now more recently with with dementia with Lewy bodies as well. Um, the reason we're, we're involved in this area is really because um, if we can identify the immune system as having a, a key role in dementia with Lewy bodies, for example, then, then that really opens the, the door, uh, opens new paths to, to new treatments that could um, potentially slow down the, the disease or, or stop it in its tracks. That's what, why we're all in the job that we are, are in, to try to figure out new ways that we can, we can identify to try to stop the disease. Um, I won't labour this slide because you are all experts on DLB much more than I am in terms of um, uh, living with it and, and being aware of it. Um, I would just draw your attention to, to one point on this slide, or, or two points, I should say. Um, a, a few years ago, my supervisor and I, that's Professor Clive Holmes and I, were, were talking about the, the clinical symptoms, the, the features of DLB, um, and we, we noted that um, the symptoms of visual hallucinations um, and fluctuations are quite similar to what we see in a condition called delirium. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of delirium, but for those of you who haven't, it's a condition that older people generally um, can get uh, when they have an infection and it causes increased confusion for a period of time, it can cause fluctuations and it can cause um, hallucinations as well. Um, and that really got us thinking about whether the immune system does play a role in DLB or not because of the overlap of symptoms between DLB and delirium. And I'll come on to, to why we think the immune system might, might play a role in DLB in, in a little while. Um, but just um, before we get on to that, uh, I should just give some background about what the immune system is and what inflammation is because I've used those terms interchangeably um, so far. Um, I'm sure everyone is um, 
up to speed with the new um, uh, potential vaccines for coronavirus. So there's lots of um, uh, uh, topics in the news regarding uh, the importance of the immune system and, and, and the role that it plays. So very uh, broadly, the immune system is there to protect your body from um, bacteria and viruses in the environment. Um, it also is involved in um, uh, repairing uh, tissue after, for example, an injury or after a broken bone um, and also after surgery. So it does, does a lot uh, and its primary function is to protect and heal the body. Um, and that's a good thing. We, we want the immune system to function correctly. We don't want to stop it from doing what it does, does well. Where things can become more problematic are when the immune system uh, targets your own body, uh, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, um, or when it doesn't switch off like it should do. So the immune system should do what it does best and then sit back and relax after the job is done. But sometimes in certain um, conditions, it can carry on um, and, and cause what we call chronic um, immune activation. And that's not, um, not helpful. And we'll come on to that again on a later slide. Um, in terms of uh, the, the parts of the immune system. So there are, are various parts of the immune system, which I'll, I'll come on to on, on the next slide. So just before I mention that, um, just to explain what the, what the term inflammation is. So inflammation is essentially the, the biological response of the immune system. Um, and if I use an analogy, if I say, um, if I uh, use the analogy of um, uh, emergency medical care. So um, the emergency medical care in the UK is, consists of uh, the road network, of ambulances, of paramedics, of hospitals, of uh, telephone calls between all of those people. Um, but the um, response uh, to an emergency, so for example, a car crash, would be that those um, elements of the healthcare system um, target and focus in on, on, on what's happening. So they drive to the road that, where the accident is, you'll have paramedics getting out of the, out, out of the ambulance, helping the patients um, and calling back to the hospital, telling them that they're on their way. And um, so inflammation is essentially that the response of the immune system to a particular trigger, like an infection, um, like surgery, like an injury, um, uh, like a cut, uh, uh, any, any of those things can trigger um, inflammation um, and can trigger activation of the immune system. Um, so the, I think um, the more I read about the immune system, the more work I do, the more amazed I am at what it can do. And so you may well have come across some of these ideas um, in the media when we were talking about immunity to coronavirus and, and the response to the coronavirus vaccine. Um, but in broad terms, the, the immune system has, has two um, uh, branches, I'd say. So one is called the innate immune system, um, and that's uh, that usually consists of um, cells, white blood cells in the blood called macrophages, and they are normally the first to be activated. So if we use the example of this nail going through this poor person's finger, um, the macrophages, uh, so the, these white blood cells will migrate straight towards the site of injury, uh, normally within minutes, um, and they will release uh, chemicals called cytokines, which will um, uh, basically try to um, uh, stop any uh, infection coming in, so any, any bacteria or viruses getting in. They also um, would cause the swelling, the redness, um, the, the warmth that you get around that injury, and that's all in order to try and protect the body from anything else getting in. Um, a bit later than that, so perhaps hours or days later, a, a, the second part of the immune system is activated, and that's called the adaptive immune system. Uh, and the cells that you might have heard of um, in, your, um, uh, in your own reading or in, in the media are, are things like B cells or T cells. Um, so you, we need B cells and T cells because they are much more specific in their response. They will um, uh, know exactly what to look out for in terms of parts of the virus or parts of the bacteria, and they will target those, those aspects um, of, of the, the threat to the body. And there's also a key component here called memory. So T cells and B cells are involved in remembering uh, the presence of a bacteria or a virus um, so that next time it comes along, um, the body can react that much quicker um, and eliminate the, the bacteria or the virus. 
So um, I think it's an amazing thing, the immune system and inflammation when it works well. Um, and it's clearly going to be um, very important in, our, our, uh, in the next few months when, when the, the coronavirus vaccine is rolled out. We want the, um, the vaccine to be uh, specific to coronavirus and we want, it to, we want people's bodies to remember um, the, the immune response. Um, so as I mentioned in my last slide, that um, inflammation is a, a good thing in response to things like infections and surgery and, um, and trauma. Um, but when it uh, goes unchecked or um, when it is chronic, so it, it carries on for a long time, it can be much more damaging. And we'll come on to why that might be. Um, I should just note here that, that um, I've talked about um, what, what I call peripheral inflammation. So um, uh, outside of the brain, so things like infections of the chest or of the urine, surgery to the body or, or a, a nail through a finger, these are all outside of the brain. So um, I guess that the, the logical question is, what is what has this got to do with dementia? Um, and I'll come on to that now. Um, I think all of us can relate to this picture. If you've got a, a bad cold, like I've had in the last few days, um, you can feel pretty tired, quite miserable in your mood. Um, you, you don't want to go out. Um, you might lose your appetite. You might feel very confused. Um, during the during the infection. And it's interesting to note that um, that's the case if you've got a, a cold, for example, which affects your throat and your lungs, but, but it makes you feel um, confused. And, and, and the, the, the things on the on the slides here are all related to um, brain function. So um, it's a, I think it's a key point to note that um, peripheral inf infections can um, cause cytokines to cross into the brain, these chemical messages of, messages of the immune system to cross into the brain and cause these symptoms. Um, and that's particularly a, a problem if you've got dementia. And I'll, I'll explain that now. Um, so we did a, a study um, about 10 years or so now uh, ago, um, looking at the role of infections in Alzheimer's disease. And I'll give you a bit of background before I talk you through the slide. Um, we often found in clinic that people um, with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia would um, uh, report feeling much more confused during an infection and um, uh, that uh, the patient's uh, carers or loved ones would, would often tell us that um, the person with dementia uh, would um, be more confused after the infection and, and never actually go back to the way they, they were before the infection. I don't know if anyone in the audience has had that experience at all um, on a personal or professional level but it's something that we hear a lot in clinic um, so we did a study in Southampton about 10 years or so ago uh, where we sampled I think it was 300 people with Alzheimer's disease on the south coast uh, and we took um, blood samples looking at uh, a marker called TNF alpha uh, and TNF alpha is a cytokine it's a chemical messenger in the immune system uh, and it's a very key key part of the immune system um, and and it, at high levels of TNF alpha indicates that um, somebody's immune system, someone's inflammation is, is very much activated. Um, and we followed um, these 300 people up uh, over the course of six months, um, and we saw them uh, four times during those um, six months. Um, and we did uh, some memory test uh, uh, examinations um, with these people. So we did the ADAS COG, which is a memory test score. Um, and we uh, essentially um, uh, split the, the, after we gathered all the data, looking at the concentration of TNF alpha in the blood, we uh, looked at how people uh, progressed with their dementia over the course of six months. So um, if you can see the, uh, the dots, uh, the, the squares and the, um, the diamonds at month zero um, and see how they progress over the six months. So the people with um, Alzheimer's disease who had lots of inflammation, lots of TNF alpha in their blood, declined over the six months, as you'd expect. Um, but very interestingly, the people with lower levels of inflammation in their blood didn't decline over the course of the six months. And I'm aware that this is a relatively short time period, um, but I think it's an important um, study and one which has sort of um, uh, spawned lots of other research into this area, which I'll, I'll come on to again a little later. Um, so the key point here is that, that higher levels of inflammation in the blood can um, uh, potentially uh, accelerate um, uh, cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease, in particular for this study. Um, so 
just thinking about um, the um, uh, importance of that. So trying to bring together everything I've said so far and, and feel free to ignore the, the text on this slide if you can't see it, but I just want to focus on, on the pictures. Um, so on the, on the right hand side at the top, this is a, a healthy brain. So um, the arrow from um, down from the body uh, indicates um, inflammation coming into the brain. And that's normal, that happens all the time. So for example, if you've got a cold, you'll have a signal of inflammation that crosses into the brain and the microglial cells, these are the immune system, immune cells of the brain that you can see with the, the blue sort of circles with um, some um, projections coming off them. They get activated by that signal from the periphery. Um, and that normally results in them releasing some cytokines, some chemical messengers in the brain. And that can cause a little bit of damage to the brain, but normally not too much. And after the infection has passed, um, the microglial cells essentially calm down again and carry on their routine surveillance around the brain, uh, making sure everything's okay. Um, that's, that picture is very different, we think, in Alzheimer's disease in particular, but we think in other types of dementia as well, potentially, um, where in the brain uh, of someone with dementia, there is already lots of protein uh, that's been deposited. So proteins like amyloid um, and tau in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that causes the microglial cells to already be on edge. So they are already primed um, and they overreact when there's a, an infection that comes in from the periphery. Um, so the example here is that if you have a urinary tract infection, um, the, the cytokines cross into the brain, the microglia are already very sensitive and already on edge. And then they overreact and uh, throw out many more cytokines, which cause even more damage. And that might be the explanation as to why people with um, Alzheimer's disease in particular, uh, become much more confused in general after, after an infection. Um, so that theory um, really developed into the next idea, which is uh, that's all well and good, but can we use that to try and stop um, uh, this reaction from happening? Um, so again, another study in Southampton, um, we essentially uh, took a drug that is widely used in rheumatoid arthritis called etanercept, which um, some of you may be aware of. Um, and, that, and that, interestingly, is a drug that, drug that blocks TNF-alpha. It stops um, TNF-alpha from, from functioning as it normally would. So we um, recruited 40 people uh, with Alzheimer's disease into a clinical trial. Um, it was a, a randomized trial, so some people had um, a placebo and some people had uh, the real drug, a tamocept. Um, uh, the investigators didn't know who was on which and the, the, the participants didn't know either. Um, and we um, used various different um, outcome measures, but I'll just focus on two for the purposes of this talk. So the MMSE, uh, which is the mini mental state examination, which looks at memory in particular, uh, but cognitive function overall and the Bristol Activities of Daily Living Scale, which looks at how much help somebody needs. Um, so we um, followed people up um, as part of this study over the course of uh, just shy of six months. Um, and um, the uh, black, uh, blacked out uh, squares are the uh, group of participants who um, were on the placebo. So who weren't taking the etanocept. And you can see that um, their memory, uh, people in that group, their memory tends, tended to decline as um, time went on over the six months, um, as you would expect. Um, and um, the uh, level of um, functional um, uh, difficulties, that the amount of support that someone needs um, uh, also increased as time went on. Um, in the, the placebo group, the one that's um, blacked out. So I'm hoping you can see the colours on your on your screen. Yeah. Um, so that's in stark comparison to the uh, treatment group with etanercept, which essentially showed uh, no significant decline over over six months, which is which was a really promising study, and um, uh, that's been uh, published in Neurology. And I don't know, Professor Holmes is is, is looking for. Um, uh, uh, support for a larger study. So that's something that's that's um, that's underway at the moment. Um, but this is a really interesting prospect because it's a drug that's already known to be safe and it's widely used. And if it can be used to um, slow down the decline of Alzheimer's disease, our, 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 our question really is, can it be used in, in other types of dementia? And if so, at what stage? So just thinking about um, uh, 
what we know about inflammation from research studies. I've spoken a lot about Alzheimer's disease and um, there's now a wealth of evidence supporting um, uh, inflammation and the immune system as a key driver of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there's now some work looking at um, how we can stop that as well in Alzheimer's disease. When we started looking in DLB in 2014, there was there were very few studies looking at the role of the immune system in DLB. And the studies that had been done um, were very small and they were all also conflicting in terms of the messages that they were concluding with. Um, so there really wasn't a conclusive picture. I think that has changed over the next over the last few years, which is really pleasing to see. Um, but I think at, at the point of starting our projects, um, we were really left with the question, does inflammation play a role in DLB? Is it different to Alzheimer's disease? Uh, and if so, can we can we use what we know to target um, the immune system for a new treatment? So I'm just going to stop there because I, the, the next part of my talk is, is looking at the projects that were funded by the Lewy Body Society. So um, that's the, the, the background that's, um, that I just wanted to cover before we do that. So I don't know if there's any questions in the chat at all. Yeah, there's um, a question um, in the chat box, Jay, which is, are there any studies of patients with rheumatoid arthritis on... I'm just trying to pronounce the word now. <laughs> Antecept, looking at incident of dementia. Yep, uh, so uh, there are, they've been, um, some of the results have been fairly conflicting to date. Um, so, um, but I am aware that, um, I think the Alzheimer's Society have just funded a, a huge project based in um, Northern Ireland, um, but also across the UK, which Salampton are part of, which is looking at exactly this. So following up a, a large number of people with rheumatoid arthritis who are, some of, it, some of whom are on etanercept, some of whom are, aren't, and looking at the, um, the number of people who go on to get dementia. Um, so I think um, looking at other conditions, so um, conditions like um, inflammatory bowel disease, um, obesity, which is also associated with inflammation. Um, there's, there's evidence that people with these uh, chronic inflammatory conditions are at increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease later in life. Uh, and it's thought that might be related to um, uh, the role of the immune system in this disease. There's no other questions at this point, Jay. Okay, brilliant. I'll, I'll carry on to the next part and I'll, I'll stop in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so um, again for any, any, any questions. Oh, just muted myself. Okay, um, so uh, in terms of what we what we did uh, in 2014, so we uh, decided to investigate the role of inflammation in DLB and I mentioned at the start that um, we really didn't know very much about it at, 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 the, start, at the start of our project. Um, and our, our hypothesis uh, was that inflammation um, was altered in dementia with Lewy bodies and it will be associated with um, the pathology in the brain and also the clinical symptoms of the disease. Uh, so in order to investigate this, we split our study into two projects essentially, and we uh, did a clinical study looking at blood markers of inflammation, and we did a post-mortem study looking at brain tissue and we looked at um, markers of um, microglial activation. So if you remember, the microglial cells are the immune cells of the brain. So we looked at uh, microglia um, in uh, brain tissue at post-mortem. So I'll start with the uh, post-mortem study first, and I'll explain what we did and our results um, and signpost you to the publication. And then I'll stop for any questions before going on to the clinical study. Um, so just a, a bit of background about um, the post-mortem study. Um, so we know that the DLB brain is characterized by the presence of Lewy bodies. And I, I hope you can see on this slide uh, a spectrum of severity of the number of Lewy bodies that are present in, in people's brains from uh, one on the left, which is mild, to four on the right, which is very severe. Um, and this is a way that um, neuropathologists will um, quantify the, the severity of um, Lewy body disease at, at post-mortem examination, so after somebody's died, um, to um, help with 
regards to clarifying diagnosis. And, and this uh, uh, is actually zero to four scale uh, was proposed by Ian McKeith and others um, in, their, um, in the third consensus criteria in 2015, which seems like a very long time ago now. Um, so it's important to note that there are obviously Lewy bodies in the DLB brain, um, but there are also, um, there's also evidence of other proteins in, in the brain of people with DLB. Um, so on the left here, you've got an amyloid plaque, and on the right, you've got a, what we call a tau tangle. So amyloid plaques and tau tangles are um, very um, often present in Alzheimer's disease. In fact, they're the defining features of Alzheimer's disease, but there is also overlap in, in DLB. So um, DLB has a, often has a mixture of Lewy bodies, um, uh, amyloid plaques, and tau tangles in the brain, um, which I guess makes it all the more difficult to tease their conditions apart, um, especially in clinic. Um, so that's um, just about the, a quick reminder about the neuropathology, which we'll come on to in the study when we when we look at that, that in the brains of the people who donated their donated their brain tissue. Um, and uh, just a quick recap about microglia. So I've mentioned them a couple of times already. These are the immune cells of the brain. So um, they're very similar to the macrophages that you get in, uh, in the blood. Uh, and this is a very, very busy slide, but I'll just focus on, 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 on a key point, which hopefully the slide illustrates. Um, and, and that is that microglia can, can um, uh, adopt a wide array of functions. So they will, um, in their normal functioning, um, uh, essentially look around the brain uh, for any um, bacteria or viruses or repair any damage to any synapses or any brain cells that might have died. Uh, and that's part of their normal functioning. They also can um, phagocytose or eat up um, any debris that might be found in the brain. Um, and you can use um, uh, a technique, uh, which I'll come on to, a, a laboratory technique, to look at the different receptors on the cell. Um, so I don't know if you can see here, but there are lots of different um, names and numbers around the microglial cell. And these are all proteins that sit on top of the microglial cell that you can detect. And, and by detecting those, that can give you an indication of what that cell is doing. Um, is it activated? Is it resting? Is it uh, mobile around the brain? Um, is it um, actively eating up um, debris in the brain? Um, is it um, uh, involved in a regulation type um, profile? So there are lots of things that the microglial cells do and, and we can um, essentially uh, gather a profile of what they're like um, by using a technique called immunohistochemistry, which I'll, I'll explain now. Um, so, Moving on to the detail of the post-mortem study that we did, we obtained um, brain tissue from 59 people who had donated their brains uh, during their life uh, to be given after they died, uh, which is a very selfless thing to do, but something that we are incredibly grateful for. Um, and um, 30 of those uh, people had dementia of Lewy bodies that was con confirmed um, at post-mortem examination. Um, so we, we, we um, got uh, uh, sections of a certain area of the brain um, and we um, use a technique called immunohistochemistry which if you look on the right hand side of the slide essentially turns the, the brain tissue at the top into um, some stained tissue at the bottom so we're essentially looking for a particular protein um, and we were looking for all of these proteins so alpha synuclein for Lewy bodies, um, amyloid beta for wax and phosphotau for tangles um, so the slide here um, is uh, showing up a, a couple of amyloid plaques, which you can hopefully see in brown um, on the um, uh, kind of grey bluish uh, background of the, of the brain tissue. Um, and we can use computer, take, take digital images and use computer processing to quantify the amount of that brown staining, the amount of amyloid protein in that area of the brain. And we do that by taking dozens and dozens of pictures across a large area and run them through a, a computer, um, a piece of computer equipment to um, capture and process those images. So it gives a, it's a, a really uh, a robust technique which allow, enables us to quantify or measure the amount of uh, protein in the brain. So we're looking at, um, as I said, markers of the neuropathology, so the Lewy bodies, the plaques and the tangles. 
um, but also we're looking at markers of microglial activation. So IBA1, HLADR, and CD68 are, are all markers of um, microglial activation. Um, so hopefully we, we, we really wanted to look at um, confirming whether there's um, uh, increased protein uh, levels in the, the, um, in the brains of people with DLB. And we were really interested in to, to see whether the microglial cells were activated um, uh, or not. So in terms of our results, um, just looking at alpha synuclein uh, initially, and those, that's the protein that makes up Lewy bodies. Uh, we looked at a control group um, who were uh, old but didn't have dementia. Um, and we looked at a DLB group, so that's people with DLB, um, and we looked at the same part of the brain. And, and we essentially looked at their scores of the severity of Lewy bodies um, in the brain. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned earlier that there's a scale of zero to four. So in our control group, reassuringly, there was no evidence of um, Lewy bodies in the brain. Uh, our DLB group had a varying level, and I think that's what we would expect because we only looked at one part of the brain. Um, and as we expected, we also saw increased levels of um, amyloid beta and phospho tau. So the amyloid plaques and the tau that tangles that you can see at the bottom, uh, we saw increased levels um, in DLB compared to controls. And again, that's what we would expect. I mentioned a couple of slides ago that there is um, uh, uh, evidence of plaques and tangles in, in the brains of people with, with DLB. Uh, and so that was a finding that we expected. So, that, so we can confirm that there's significantly more neuropathology in DLB. Um, so in, if I could just uh, go, on a, uh, go off on a slight tangent. So in Alzheimer's disease, that increased neuropathology is associated with lots of microglial activation. So we were expecting something similar in DLB. What we found, however, was, was very surprising. So we didn't find any difference in microglial activation between our control brains and our, uh, the brains of uh, people who had DLB when they were alive. Um, and you can see the microglial cells here at the bottom. Um, and these are three markers that look at slightly subtly different aspects of microglial function. And, and none of them um, were significantly different. And I can add on, I haven't done it today because of the interest of time, but there are three more slides looking at nine more, nine different markers that show, show the, same, um, the same finding. Um, and that's a very different um, finding to what we find in Alzheimer's disease. So we um, didn't find any, any difference in microglial markers in, in DLB um, compared to a control group. So just wrapping up that part of the project and, and uh, talking about what all this might mean, um, looking at, so we've looked at brain inflammation in DLB using what I still think is the largest number of uh, brains used in a study of this type. Um, and we confirmed increased neuropathology in, in one area of the brain in DLB. Um, but what we didn't find was any evidence of microglial activation in DLB. I think that's really noteworthy um, because um, that uh, it, it's noteworthy because there are, we, we have two different types of dementia. We've got Alzheimer's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. So they're both characterized by protein deposition in the brain, but that have very different um, uh, profiles of inflammation in the brain. And I think that opens up lots of questions uh, about why that might be. Um, and it also opens up a question about whether um, DLB is perhaps more um, uh, uh, susceptible to uh, treatments um, if there isn't a, a lot of inflammation in the brain. I would just qualify that by saying there's, there have been studies since looking at early DLB, so prodromal or mild DLB um, in centres such as Newcastle and Cambridge, some really good work. Uh, involving imaging studies in particular, which has shown that in very early disease, there might be increased microglial activation. So it could be that um, early in the disease, there's a peak of inflammation, um, and that later on, by the time that someone has passed away and a post-mortem is done, that, that activation has subsided. So it could be um, that um, inflammation plays a key role in DLB early on in the disease and that later on um, it, it then um, subsides and that has important implications in terms of treatment. So it might be that we trial anti-inflammatory drugs in mild DLB but they wouldn't be appropriate in people with more uh, moderate or severe disease. Um, and at the bottom I've got the, the reference um, of the paper that again the Louis Body Society very kindly supported in getting published this year just in case anyone wanted to um, read up further about that. 
Well, I'll, I'll stop there for now and just see if there's any other questions that anyone had. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions, um, Jay. First of all, does the severity of the pathology correlate to the clinical picture? That's a really good question and something that we've been mulling over for, for a while, actually. Um, so there's, there's evidence that, um, so, so firstly, in our study, we didn't find any correlations between inflammation and the, um, the, the uh, severity of pathology. Um, in um, other studies that have looked at that question, there's evidence that um, the severity of um, Lewy body pathology doesn't correlate with um, clinical features and clinical progression. Um, and the same goes for amyloid in um, Alzheimer's disease. The severity, the amount of amyloid in the brain doesn't correlate with the severity of dementia. Um, however, tau does seem to be um, a key factor. So tau is the um, uh, protein that makes up intracellular tangles, the, the tangles that are inside the cells. Um, and there is evidence that that um, uh, tau does uh, correlate with um, progression of Alzheimer's disease. Just focusing on DLB, however, um, there's evidence that people with both um, Lewy body pathology and Alzheimer's disease pathology together tend to progress faster in their disease. Um, that's sort of fairly early data, but, but I think that does make sense. If you've got more of the protein um, uh, deposition in the brain, it might well be that your dementia progresses quicker. Okay, thank you, Jay. Um, second question, inflammation, someone who suffered from chronic urinary tract infection until his prostate was reduced, could this cause DLB in later years? Uh, so, yeah, another very good question. Um, so I think chronic inflammation um, might increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. We, we, we're pretty clear on that. Whether it increases the risk of DLB, we just don't know at this stage. I think I think we need much more work to, to look at that. Um, I think it's worth saying that chronic inflammation um, is generally a pretty bad thing. So it will increase your risk of, of lots of other things. So things like stroke and uh, um, uh, heart disease in particular. Um, so I think if um, people uh, do have uh, recurrent infections and um, chronic inflammatory conditions, we in Southampton feel that that's, a, that's something that more research is required in order to try and understand that more and see whether we can do anything to, to stop it from happening. The difficulty we have is uh, inflammation, as I said at the start, is a good thing. We don't want to stop the immune system from doing what it does well. So the immune system is there to protect you from bacteria and viruses and, and repair your body after injury. So we really do have to find the balance between stopping the unharmful, the harmful parts of the immune response, but keeping the helpful parts. And that, that's really tricky to do. Um, yeah. um, OK, um, last question. Um, very topical um, at the moment. Um, do you think patients with um, Lewy body dementia will react? How do you think that patients with Lewy body dementia will react to a COVID vaccine in a positive way? Uh, good question. I don't think I know the, the answer to that question, I'm afraid. I know um, some colleagues in Newcastle and Cambridge have just recently published a paper looking at the impact of COVID-19 on people with dementia with Lewy bodies in particular. I haven't read it yet, unfortunately. It's on my desktop still, um, but that might, might provide the answer. Um, I, my general feeling is that actually the, the amount of microglial activation, the amount of inflammation in the brain of people with DLB is, is not as much as found in Alzheimer's disease. So um, it might be that um, people with, uh, and I'm speculating here, um, it might be that people with DLB don't respond as badly as people with Alzheimer's disease to, to, a, to a vaccine. Um, so, so people with Alzheimer's disease might find that their immune systems are activated with a vaccine and they might find that they are potentially uh, a little more confused for a period of time because of the reasons I've explained. Um, but it might be that with DLB that, that isn't the case, but I, I must say I am speculating here. So. Okay, that's that's the last of the questions for the moment. Brilliant. How am I doing for time, Jackie? I've got about 10 or 15 minutes left. Yeah, 15 minutes. Yeah, okay. Do, yeah, does it matter if we go a bit over? Thank you everyone. Okay, so just moving on. 
Um, just going to move on to the clinical study now, um, which I must say I had much more enjoyment doing, um, uh, seeing people rather than looking down a microscope for, for days and weeks on end. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, they're both very important studies, I think. Um, so looking at the clinical study now, we're very lucky in Southampton that we've got access to, um, at the time we had access to the Wessex um, uh, immunology hub um, in Southampton that we call the Wish Lab, um, which is the I think it's the red and yellow floor on that um, on that diagram or on the picture, um, and uh, that's a, a hub for um, uh, immunologists to come together with other scientists to look at various aspects of um, uh, of research. And during the course of the project, we also were very lucky that Southampton University and collaborators funded, I think it was a £25 million Centre for Cancer Immunology, which we're slowly starting to try and take over and call the Southampton Centre for Dementia Immunology. But we're, yeah, don't tell the cancer specialist that just yet. Um, but we are trying our best. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're very well set up in terms of immunologists in Southampton to provide um, uh, interpretation for the findings that we have from our research studies, because I must admit, I'm not an immunologist, I'm a psychiatrist, and lots, some of the terms that I've used today took me, um, it took me a very long time to get my head around. Um, so it's helpful to have um, uh, experts on site to be able to, to help with that. So looking at what we did um, for our clinical study, we, we did a, a clinical trial in and around Hampshire, uh, and it was cross-sectional in nature. So it was just a, the one time point that we asked people to come into uh, the clinic for. Uh, and we recruited 95 volunteers and 32 people with DLB, um, including, I think, a trustee of the Living Body Society. Um, and 31 people with Alzheimer's disease um, and uh, 32 um, uh, older people who didn't have dementia. So um, we termed them controls. Um, and we uh, asked them to come into clinic and I confirmed the diagnosis with, with the people that came in um, or confirmed they didn't have dementia in the case of the controls um, volunteers. Uh, and we did various tests for um, aspects of DLB, so we looked at their memory, their mood, the fluctuations for Parkinsonism and for other things as well. Um, and we, um, the, the key part of the study is that we took uh, a blood sample and we took that to look at concentrations of cytokines, which are the, the, the immune chemical messengers in the blood. Uh, and we also looked at the white blood cells themselves to look at the different proportions of those cells. And I'll come on to both of those parts as, as we go along the, the next couple of minutes. Um, just looking at the, the, the characteristics of the volunteers, so we, we split them into three groups based on their diagnosis. Um, and you can see here on the first row that the DLB and the AD participants were generally older on average than the control participants. Um, and there were some gender differences as well between the groups. Um, but they were otherwise relatively well matched for um, years of education, for disease duration, and the AD and DLB group were, were relatively similar when it came to the MOCA score, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Score, which is another uh, memory test score. Um, so we just a, a note, we did need to, um, ideally we would have had the control group as the same age as the DLB and AD group. And I think in future studies, we'll definitely do that. So we did have to use some um, statistical uh, adjustment to correct for that. So um, all the results you see from now on have already had that um, correction done. Um, so again, another busy slide, but I'll, I'll try and pick out the key message. Um, along the, the left-hand column, you can see the different cytokines that we use. So IL stands for interleukin, and that's the most common type of um, chemical immune messenger. Um, so there are lots of different types of cytokines. They all do subtly different things. Um, I'd say that, that the key cytokines, cytokines are probably IL-1 beta and TNF-alpha. Um, so we found um, that people with DLB uh, on average had more IL-1 beta in their blood and more IL-6 in their blood than um, healthy control people. So that was the key message from um, this part of the study that we found increased concentrations of these two what we call pro-inflammatory cytokines. So they're not the cytokines that would be trying to dampen down the immune response or, or inv are involved in healing. They're the ones that are, are driving forward and really um, cause, potentially causing damage if, if left unchecked. 
Um, so um, that was a that's a, a novel finding. So um, that's something that um, extends similar findings in other types of dementia and other uh, diseases like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, so uh, just to recap, we found increased concentrations of these cytokines in, in DLB, and I'll come into why that might be important um, in, in a moment. Um, but just going off on uh, looking at the um, other aspect of the study that we looked at. So we looked at the um, immune cells. Um, and um, this is a, 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 a picture of what an immune cell might look like, what a white blood cell might look like, which is more bluey rather than, rather than white, um, with uh, different receptors on the surface. And similar to the microglial cell that we saw earlier that had lots of different receptors on the cell surface, the white blood cells in the blood have, have the same thing. So they have different um, receptors on their surface, most of which start with CD, um, and then various numbers afterwards. And, and by measuring the proportions of those different white blood cells, you can um, uh, interpret what the immune system is doing, whether it's activated, whether it's worn out, whether it's um, in a relaxed phase. Um, so um, it's, uh, you can use a, a, um, a technique called flow cytometry, which I'll come on to in a moment, which, which is a really fancy uh, piece of equipment in order to, to detect exactly this. Um, so some of you may recognize some of the cell types here. Again, it's quite topical with COVID and, and the, the, the helper T cell response to the vaccine and the B cells that get involved in uh, remembering um, uh, coming across a bacteria or a virus. So there are lots of different types of um, uh, cells in the uh, immune system. And these are just the, uh, are, are the main types that are involved. Um, so in order to get those cells out of uh, the blood samples that we took from our patients. This is a, um, uh, a picture of me uh, uh, in a laboratory in the hospital um, taking out the white cells from uh, patient blood samples. So at the bottom, you can see that we used a centrifuge um, to separate out um, the, the uh, I think here, the green cells, which should really be more blue, um, uh, which are separated from the plasma and uh, a chemical uh, that we use called FICOL. And um, we're left on the right hand side with just the white cells, just, just the cells that we want. So we would, we, at that point, we would wash them um, and, and wash off all the red cells and any of the other um, things that we don't want. And then we would um, uh, suspend them in, a, in a, um, a solution and freeze them in liquid nitrogen, uh, where we can keep them for up to three or four years. Um, so we did that during the study because we didn't want to process each of the samples as we went along. We wanted them to do them all in one go. Uh, for various scientific reasons um, and for convenience. So that's what we what we did. And um, at the end of the study, we um, used a, a machine called a flow cytometer, which I said was a very fancy piece of kit. It essentially, for those of you who don't know, essentially uh, is, a, is a piece of kit which sucks up the white blood cells from the sample that you've got and fires them through um, uh, a number of laser beams. Uh, and then detects the light that reflects off those laser beams. And it basically gives you an indication of what receptors are on each one of those cells. So on, on these graphs, each single dot is a cell uh, in your, your patient sample. Um, and we can then look at um, the number of uh, live cells in that sample uh, and just focus on those. Um, and then we can separate out the cells that are B cells, that are T cells, and then we can separate out the T cells and, and check if they're helper T cells or cytotoxic T cells. And by doing this, we get a really good picture about the proportions of the different white cells um, in people with, with DLB and Alzheimer's disease. So in terms of our results, again, this is a busy slide, slide for which I apologize, but the, the two lines in bold are, are our significant findings. So we, we, we found um, a significantly reduced level of um, uh, T helper cells in DLB and a significantly reduced level of activated B cells in DLB. And I'll just, um, if there's sort of one thing, one message that you get from this slide, it would be just to compare that with Alzheimer's disease and the control group. So um, generally speaking, the, uh, uh, the DLB group um, in terms of those two outcomes were lower than controls and the AD group was higher than controls. Um, and nearly across the board, we kind of found the opposite, the opposite finding between DLB and AD in terms of, um, of other cell proportions. Um, so 
our key finding here was that there were, was evidence of reduced activation of uh, helper T cells and B cells in DLV. Uh, and these are cells involved in the adaptive immune system, which I think if you remember um, a, an earlier slide, is the, the, the part of the immune system that, that, um, that kicks in hours or days after, um, after an infection. So what we normally expect is if you've got lots of um, cytokines in the blood, you'd expect increased activation of the adaptive immune system, which is what we get in Alzheimer's disease. So if for some reason we're seeing the opposite finding in dementia with Lewy bodies, and we're, we're still not sure why, uh, I'll come on, to, come on to that in a moment. Um, but just to summarise this part of the, the talk, and I've only got, I think, one or two slides after this, um, our clinical study found increased cytokine concentrations in DLB, uh, and we also found changes to the adaptive immune system. And actually, when we drilled down uh, this further, we thought that the profile of the immune system in DLB, adaptive immune system in DLB, might be showing what we call a worn out profile. And I don't know whether that's because people with DLB might be experiencing more triggers for the immune system, for example, more infections, more falls um, and other factors, or whether there's something else that we haven't thought of yet. But I think it's a really interesting finding um, and something that we intend to look into further to really pin down what that might mean. So this um, uh, is another paper that the Louis Body Society very kindly supported in getting published this year in the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry. Uh, and I, I don't think I put the year on there or the, the details of the reference, so I think they might well be on the website, so apologies about that. Uh, but, but if you want to read any more about this study, um, that's where, that's where you, can, you can find it. So just in terms of final comments, uh, bringing everything together, um, I think our knowledge about the role of inflammation in DLB is now catching up with what we know in Alzheimer's disease. Um, but we still know there are still lots of things that we need to look at. So for example, we need to look at the genetics of inflammation in DLB. We need to really drill down on why, the, why there are changes to the adaptive immune system in DLB and what that might mean for patients. Um, we uh, found that brain inflammation might not be a significant feature in late disease, but as I mentioned earlier, it might be that um, in earlier disease, it could be a feature. Um, we uh, found changes to um, uh, cytokines in DLB and uh, changes to the uh, adaptive immune system. Um, and all of these things are, are, are showing a very distinct profile to AD. So in terms of what that, the clinical implications for that, it, it, putting my clinical hat on, you know, why, why does any of this matter? Um, I think it's important uh, for a couple of reasons. So one would be, I mentioned earlier, that can be quite tricky to diagnose DLB, especially early on. And um, so developing some sort of uh, blood test to um, detect uh, DLB and differentiate it from Alzheimer's disease would be a really positive step, I think, for patients, for people um, to get an earlier diagnosis. Um, another aspect would be um, regarding uh, clinical trials. So if we do um, uh, get further in terms of the use of a drug like Etanercept for Alzheimer's disease, we really do need to know whether we can use that sort of drug in dementia with Lewy bodies and whether it would be helpful or not. Um, so what we're proposing to do is, with colleagues in uh, Newcastle and Cambridge, is to put uh, a study together where we uh, recruit a, a much larger number of people with DLB um, and follow them up for a much longer period of time, so over the course of three to five years, and look at um, much more detailed aspects of their immune system. Um, and hopefully that will give us an idea as to whether um, inflammation is uh, increased in early disease. And if it is, then we can use um, we can think about trying a drug like etanercept in people with DLB in the early stages of it to see if we can um, slow down disease, uh, the disease um, and potentially even halt it for a period of time. That's really the hope, holy grail and that's what we're all, we're all working, working towards. So just lastly, I just want to acknowledge um, uh, the people on the slides, um, uh, particularly um, the Louis Body Society, as I've said multiple times, for funding the project, uh, the, the projects that I presented today, but especially the, the, the people um, who took part in the clinical study and the people who very selflessly donated their, their brains for the purposes of um, scientific research. So um, thank you to them and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Jay, and I'm sure on behalf of everybody on the call, um, thank you for taking the time out today to come in to come and speak to us.
and it's good for our supporters and fundraisers to see firsthand and listen to you firsthand um, about how the money that they raise is, is being spent and how they've contributed. Um, we've got a couple of um, final questions. Um, is there a known relationship between cancer and DLV? Hmm. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> yep, okay, fantastic. Sorry about that. Um, I am not aware of a relationship between cancer and dementia with blue bodies, but I, I'll, I'll have to double check that. Um, but I, I'm not come across anything so far in my reading. Okay, thank you. Um, and is there, any is there any evidence that having had inflammatory arthritis midlife may link um, predispose people to developing DLB? Um, not at this stage, no. I think there is there is evidence that, that there might be a link with Alzheimer's disease in terms of midlife um, chronic inflammatory conditions. So things like chronic gum disease have been shown to, to, to be linked. Um, but there isn't, as far as I'm aware, any, any evidence in, in dementia with blue bodies. Um, I think that's something, that's an important study to do. Um, it's one that's quite tricky to, to do unless you um, you do it the other way around. So you look at people with dementia with blue bodies and then look back and see whether they had chronic inflammatory conditions. Um, so I think that would be an interesting study to do. So um, just a question for me, um, what would be the logical next stage for your study that we supported as a charity? What would be the next stage to, to do? Yeah, but so I, th I think um, uh, one of the um, criticisms perhaps for the for the, the studies that I, I showed is that it looks at very different aspects of the disease. So it looks at post-mortem, which is at the end of the disease process, and it looks at um, uh, one time point during life. And I think the logical next step would be to um, conduct a, what we call a longitudinal study over time. So to um, um, uh, recruit people with DLB into a study and then see them every six months or every year for a period of say five years um, and look at um, uh, uh, the markers of the immune system but in much more depth this time around so the, the first time we did it we were just looking at the main um, um, immune cell uh, proportions and uh, the cytokine concentrations but there, there, there's, there are I'm not exaggerating uh, thousands of more markers that we could be looking at um, that would give us a much more refined um, uh, picture of what's going on in DLP. So that's what we're intending to do with, with Cambridge and Newcastle. We're just trying to put our ideas together and uh, you may well hear from us in due course about um, a funding application as well. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, and we look, we look forward to hearing more details about that. I'm sure it will be a fantastic study. Um, has, it, has anybody got any final questions before we, before we finish? Okay, Angela. Can I just ask Jay, because he's obviously been um, uh, reacting with people with Lewy body dementia in the clinical setting. My mum has constantly, throughout her whole illness, moaned of a dripping nose and having a, a nasal drip. And I was looking on some Lewy body sites in America, and there were a lot of people who said exactly the same thing. And I just wondered if you were aware of that at all, or if that was just a coincidence. So I... I, I, I uh, I've heard of that. Um, I, I haven't come across it in any reading, but I, I have had a couple of patients report that to me, actually, very interestingly. So I'll, I'll, I'll read up on that and see whether that's a, a, a recognised feature or not. I don't know if anyone else has come across that or not. No. Yeah, maybe if you could come back to us um, on that, Jay, and I can pass the details over to Angela. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank Could you. I just say that was an excellent presentation as well. Thank you so much. Very kind of you to say thank you. Yeah, no, um, I'm sure that I'm, yeah, because to have that presentation, I think, in, in a layperson's terms as well, so not something that kind of goes over our head, I think is appreciated um, by everybody. Um, and we've got some, we've got some comments um, just coming into the chat box now saying thank you very much, find it very fascinating and informative. Um, will suggest to my colleagues that they listen to the presentation when it's available um, and from other people that are, are carers um, and supporters of people living with Lewy body dementia, just thanking you for your presentation. Thank you everyone, that's very kind. And it, was a, it was a pleasure to come along today. And I, I've, I know I've said it a dozen times before, but thank you for your, your support for this charity and um, yeah, hope to work together in future.
Okay, then. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs>